Welcome to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Uh, we're about to look at the pages of a national dailies. We'll call it uh, the paper of the press. You want to see the newspaper review. J.D. Johnson joins us in no time. I set off with the Punch newspaper this morning. On the Punch, placeholder running mate, PDP sues INEC, APC6, OB, and Tinubu's disqualification. We also find uh, underneath it, one Shatima Baba Ahmed, barred as vice presidential candidate, joins doing Masari label in suit. We'll respond to PDP, says uh, Labour's lawyer. We're aware of the suit, Tinubu's legal team is quoted to say. Article orders campaign for Adelike, INEC distributes materials. We're not aware of 1.2 trillion naira proposal, says ASU. And a few. Fuel queues disperse as marketers dispense above 165 naira per litre. By Jasha Jailed for 16 years, weeps. Princess sings. <laughs> Quite interesting headline. ICPC probes MDAs over COVID-19 intervention funds. INEC probes buried PVCs and threatened sanction. Uh, it's a good thing that INEC atten INEC's attention has been drawn to it. 421 fleeing inmates recaptured and 454 at large. Confront terrorists, eliminate them, Buhari tells security agents. Jets A1 security or scarcity hits airline. Passengers protest delay flight. Muslim Muslim tickets direct attack on Christians. Uh, that's what the ex SGF is quoted to say. NETTI threatens action against oil firms over $6.4 billion debt. Well, there are more interesting headlines, which we need to move away for the want of time. Well, let's go straight uh, to the nation this morning. The nation is never has a big uh, headline. Wipe out terrorists. Buhari gives military a fresh order to military. Wipe out terrorists. Buhari gives a fresh order to military. Uh, he wasn't, you know, just speaking at a meeting with the military hierarchy on, on terrorism and saying to them, hey, guys, go wipe them out. No, uh, he attended a ceremony. Uh, uh, a graduation of 247 students of the senior course, 44 of the Armed Forces Command and Staff College, Jaji Kaduna State. You know, and uh, you know, while he gave his speech, he he talks about the difficulty the country had been facing uh, with terrorism, saying that uh, the last 12 years are the most challenging. Uh, Nigeria is set to sustain sub-regional security collaboration, and in that he said the military must wipe out uh, the terrorists from the face of the earth but it was a speech that he he was prepared and and delivered at that uh, that ceremony uh maybe nothing new <laughs> uh, more from the nation is repair why public debt will rise to uh, will rise by dmo while why public debt will rise by dmo of course uh, gdp they say will grow by 27 uh, percent uh, but this is same dmo that disagreed with uh, the cbn on the nation's debt uh, situation I'm sure that story is worth uh, a read. IPOB to UK High Commissioner, don't come to Southeast. IPOB to UK High Commissioner, don't come to Southeast. There's page three. Um, are they trying to, <laughs> you know, to bring up more of the situations that we are seeing reduced a little bit? Well, uh, you can read more on that uh, story on page three of the Nation newspaper. Sexual assault, Baba Ijesha gets five year jail term sexual assault Baba Ijesha gets five year jail term like we said the 16 years uh, uh, different years for different counts and all will run concurrently and since the highest uh, sentence on those counts uh, each of those counts is five years it means that he will spend five years in in prison uh, I carry the loose signs amendment to a more law this is the first amendment he's uh, signing since the enactment on of that law um, more from the nation. Ingege, misinforming Buhari about strikes as ASU president. 
Uh, it's a back and forth between the presidency and, of course, the Minister of Labor and Employment and ASU. Um, and it seems like there is no end in sight. Uh, the, the minister, before saying the president doesn't have any collective bargaining agreement to sign on his table, accusing the union of also uh, imposing their own you know, uh, salaries and, and wages on the NIMI BRICS uh, committee. Well, uh, they're saying the minister of, of uh, labor and employment is misinforming the president about the strike. Uh, Tinubu plans to intervene in government as to stand up. Well, <laughs> when he went to Oshobo, uh, he had a, a short meeting with the NANS president and officials of NANS. This is a national association of Nigerian students and told them that the president having uh, given a lamentation, these are Tinubu's words now, regarding the, uh, uh, the strike has now opened the floor, as it were, for other people to to engage with ASU in the president's statement now, the enough is enough statement. So Tinubu said he'll be using back channels to uh, intervene in this ASU situation. Well, you can make of that what you wish. Those are the headlines coming on the front page of the Nation newspaper. We turn attention to the Daily Trust quickly. Federal Government, British High Commission, Moom, as IPOP warns envoy to stay off Southeast. Group says High Commissioner Igbo hater. Warning shows debt of insecurity attempt to em embarrass the federal government. Uh, you find INEC staff injured as gunmen attack registration center in Enugu. 48 terrorists killed, 3,858 surrendered out in two weeks in Northeast. This is according to the defense headquarters. And uh, 23 million young Nigerians on fit for job market controversy rages over Nigeria's uh, increasing debt appetite for euro bonds. Uh, some of the headlines you find here this morning. Uh, we need to move away from the Daily Trust. All right, we'll quickly take the headlines, a few of them, on the front page of The Guardian. Uh, Muslim Muslim ticket, APC, puts on hold Shetima's unveiling opposition mounts. Uh, violence, vote buying, threaten fair, credible 2023 20, polls. A uh, big story on pages four and five of The Guardian. Court of Appeal, Sachs Bielsa, Assembly member of a defection. Over regulation, new taxes impacting business growth. Uh, survival. There are quite a number of stories on the front page of uh, The Guardian, but we'll leave it at that now and uh, bring in uh, J.D. Johnson, our guest analyst this morning. He's from the Nigerian Institute of uh, uh, Journalism, uh, Senior Director. Um, Mr. Johnson, thank you for your time. Let's start off with the big one coming on the front page of uh, the, the Guardian newspaper. It seems the APC is foot dragging on uh, the announcement on unveiling of uh, Shatima as a running mate. Or uh, to Bola Metinbu, the presidential candidate. Do you think this means that they're reconsidering the, the Muslim Muslim ticket idea? Well, uh, the deadline is, the deadline is today. If anything is not done to do, then they are stuck with it. However, the, the, there is no constitutional provision that says that they must present the candidate publicly. What is required is for them to nominate and um, to nominate their running mate and submit the name to INEC. Uh, in this case, to substitute the name with the name of the placeholder they use in the first instance. So, uh, there's it's just it might just be a tactic to to reduce the backlash and the opposition to that to that particular to that particular decision and that's why the nomination the presentation is is suspended is suspended for now until the time that is favorable so that's that's my take because there's no constitutional provision or there's no legal requirement for them to fulfill with respect to public presentation or no public presentation of their of their running mate so it's the decision they've taken and um, except they change it by informing INEC by submitting another name they are stuck with Shetima for now. Right. But let's uh, look at the punch down. Uh, it talks about the People's Democratic Party. Uh, they have instituted a lawsuit compelling the Independent National Electoral Commission to prevent all the All Progressive Congress uh, presidential candidate Bola Tunubu 
and the Labour Party standard bearer Peter Obi from replacing their running mates with Senator Kashima Shatima and Dati Baba Ahmed. What do you make of this? <laughs> you know, well, once upon a time, INEC well, said uh, it was a new, it was left, a it's left for the court to decide. It's left for the court to decide and INEC to decide moving forward. They have the right to, to litigate if they feel that um, the law has been broken. However, the courts will decide that. But I think that they should be less concerned with that. What they should concern themselves is how to bring about unity within their party hold and how to campaign for the election. We don't want the elections to be decided, 2020 elections to be decided by the, the courts. We want the people themselves to decide. So I think this matter, the court should deal with it expeditiously and allow Nigerians to determine who become their president. And we don't want to have a situation whereby uh, on the, we will not know the winner on the election day or after the election day until the courts pass the ruling. That's why we don't, we don't want that for 2020 election. And I think that's why there have been adequate provisions for all of these things to be dealt with the Electoral Act 2022 so that every issue relating to litigation will have been solved before we have the election in 2023, February. So they have a right to go to court, but the court will look at the merit of the case. But they should be much more concerned about our running. Their own internal issue before forgotten the external problems of other party. That's just my candid advice to them. Well, um, just before we move away from this issue now, we also remember that Festus Okoye had uh, made reference to the fact that, of course, Einek had said it wasn't in the constitution, but it's actually a new intervention. Nigerian intervention, the placeholder. And it wasn't really a situation or a big deal, if you like to put. So why do we have the PDP now trying to make this an issue? Well, um, the, you see, the two parties were smart in moving forward. The, the placeholders resigned they withdrew their nomination. So you have a right. It's their franchise, the right to vote and to be voted for. So we, we saw the resignation letter of, and the withdrew, withdrawal letter of these two placeholders. It, it, to the extent that the labor um, placeholder even granted a press conference, made a press statement to that effect. Why that of the APC released the press statement? So it's just the the, the, the PDP just playing to the girl. They are just wasting their time because people, these parties and their nominees have exploited a loophole in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the Constitution, in the Electoral Act. So they are, they are still operating within the ambit of the law. That's, that's my take on that. All right. Mm. All, right. Should, all this litigation and the rest of it, I think the court should quickly dispense with it so that we can know and who is contesting the election. Okay, Jenny Johnson, uh, quickly, the um, daily trust is, uh, you know, gone the way of uh, situation in the Southeast as its lead story. Um, looking at what the independent people of Biafra uh, group uh, has given as um, a directive uh, to the, the British High Commissioner, saying that she's not welcome in the Southeastern part of Nigeria, she shouldn't come there. Uh, the headline on the front page of the Daily Independent, or Daily Trust rather, uh, FG, British High Commission Mom, as uh, IPOB warns envoy to stay off Southeast. Group says High Commissioner Igbo Heta, uh, warning shows depth of insecurity, attempt to embarrass FG, don'ts. And INEC staff injured, well, this is uh, another one that's coming attack registration center. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, if, if those are monitoring, uh, the, well, the statements just, of the just, group, yes. It's just for them to draw attention. It's just for them to draw attention to the agitation. Uh, don't forget the the prominence this will do to the agitation with respect to the British High Commissioner um, placement and role in the diplomatic circle. So I think that they are really diplomatic game that there is, there is a serious issue facing us. And the diplomatic and global community is not paying attention to us. We are not getting the required traction from international agencies like United Nations, from 
from from powerful countries that could exert pressure pressure on federal government to do one or two things, uh, which British government is one of. So, uh, now they said, I just think that they are trying to draw attention, apply to let um, the international community to be aware of the prevailing situation and circumstances in the, in the, in the, in the south, the southeast. That's, it, isn't that's it, my take. Isn't that's it an irony? That the British commissioner decides to go to the southeast. Yes. Is it, is, is it an irony to you um, that, you know, the IPOB as a group have um, had a strategy uh, when looking for causes and looking for enemies, you know, if were people to point at, to blame and to be able to rally its base? It's uh, usually the British establishment, the British government over the years, they say they are the ones who have been, you know, uh, you know, partnering or supporting the northern part of the country. They put Nigeria together, you know, and all. So they blame them a lot for this. Even when the woman herself personally has not said anything against Igbos, whoever is the British High Commissioner will be blamed as our call label, uh, uh, Igbo hater, you know, if you want to call it that. But do you think it's an irony that uh, the leader of the group himself is a British passport holder and a beneficiary um, of the services of that country, even they've called on on, on the British government to say, oh, see, oh, your citizen has been extraordinarily rendered, you know, into Nigeria. Say something about this. Is this an irony to you? That, that's where the suspicion lies. That's where the suspicion lies. Um, because uh, the, in their own thinking, um, they would have felt that the British government would be more, more forthright and much more forceful ensuring that now the can the leader of the IPOB happens to be dual citizen, a citizen of Nigeria and a British citizen, will get them better treatment and better uh, recognition from the British government in terms of liaising with federal government and ensuring that now the can is given a better a better treatment, is given the issue due to his arrest and litigation will be addressed as quickly as possible. So that's where the suspicion lies. And to, to the suspicion with the British government, as far as Nigerians are concerned, is not limited to the people from the southeast. There are others from other parts of the continent, from the north, people from the south, that are suspicious. So the role that the British play in up together with the, the nation called Nigeria and the role they play in creating a lopsided arrangement but for the country. So that suspicion is eternal. It's, it's not limited to the IPOP people. It's a suspicion that an average Nigerian has with respect to how fortunate we have been in terms of having good, good government over the years feel the potential of Nigeria as a giant of Africa. Well, let's um, quickly look at the Guardian newspaper. Uh, seemed like an editorial here. Violence and vote buying threaten fair, credible 2023 polls. Feels like um, it's a reputation, something that we're very conversant with, nothing yeah. new. It's, it's, it's nothing new because it's, look, the politicians are not one massive turnout of voters. It's when you have low voters turned out that you have the opportunity of manipulating the voters. Now, when you have massive turnout of voters, one, you don't have the resources to buy all the voters. It's only when few people turn out that you have the resources to buy. So how, how do you stop massive turnout of voters? As the election is approaching, as the election is approaching, you begin to perpetuate and perpetuate violence. That itself is a scare tactic to stop people from coming out to vote. You ask yourself this question. If you actually want to win election and control the government and rule over the people and govern the people, why do you have to use violence to ensure that you win the election if you actually you are working in the interest of the people? So violence is a, is a scare tactic that the political class uses to ensure that there's no massive turnout, and then it can facilitate their vote buying. It's so only the few people that come out. A same person, look, Kofi, uh, Messi, you and I, if 
there is a gunshot in our neighborhood two days before the election. There is violence in our neighborhood three days before the election. <coughs> and nothing was done to that effect. Do you think you or I or people in my category or people in your category, with the exception of some of us that are fully resolved, will go out to vote on the day of the election? It is only those that are pressured, that have needs, that have been improvised, will come out because they have something or one or two things to gain. That's why. And that's, it's a tactic. And then I ask you, have they prosecuted all those they arrested for violence in 2019 election? Have they prosecuted all those they arrested for 2015 election? Have they, have they, look, we have a classic case. Let me end with this. We have a classic case in which the returning officer said gun was based on his head to declare the result of a senatorial election. And till then, the winner of that gun old election is still a senator of the Federal Republic. All right. Um, let's uh, let's let's look at one on the front page of the the Punch newspaper. The pictures, you know, coming out online. Thank God for the internet, because uh, nothing is hidden these days. Of um of of of, of buried PVCs and the politicians' uh, 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 property. You know, uh, hundreds of them, if you want to call it that, looking dirty and all that. And I think now having to come out to Spitfire to say they're going to to investigate it and they are threatening sanctions on whoever is involved in this whole dirty or buried PVC saga. I mean, this is quite embarrassing. Uh, w what's your analysis of this? Look, you can follow the trail. Why am I coming out to see from which local government, from which, for example, which state, the state, I've traced the state, the state to the local government, from which local government, which local government to which unit, What's the timeline? Who was the INEC resident electoral officer for the local government? Who is the INEC resident uh, elect commissioner, state electoral commissioner, resident electoral commissioner for the state? Now, who are those that were involved in the registration of those people? And then, who are those that were in custody of those PVC that should be released to individual that was released? It's not the timeline. Coming out to say you don't just just do the paper trade. If you do the paper trade, you get this thing. It will take you one week to do it. They can hire me to come and do it for them. In fact, they can give me all the document and bring it to my house. I will do it for them for free, and I will tell them those that are culpable. And it's, you don't need to set up a special committee, waste money, waste anything. All you need to do is to do the paper trade and the timeline and get to the bottom of it. But this is the beginning and the end of what you hear of it. But, um, G.D. Johnson, th this is not the first time we're hearing about attacks on, you know, the offices of INEC in different parts of the country. I mean, between 2019 and 2021, it's been reported that 41 offices of INEC has been attacked in 14 states. And topping the list or the log for these attacks, you have, um, you know, Emo State. So it's been going on. I mean, why haven't we been able to find a way? Because this looks like an attack on our democracy. Well, um, uh, in fact, any attempt to truncate democratic process is insurrection. And it should be treated. It should be treated as such, like the cards you talk about. Is the same thing with the security. Are these people ghost? Don't they have identity? What is the intelligence community doing? What are security agencies to respect to this? Can these people be traced? How is it possible for people to foment trouble and perpetuate crime? continuously, without being trapped, without being arrested, it's, 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 it's something which is... You relate that to the story on which the president, uh, during the graduation of a uh, student in Jaji, from the staff college in Jaji, 
where he said he directed them the, 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 the military to ensure that they how did he even put it there? to wipe I'm trying wipe, to look at yeah he said they should wipe, wipe um, terrorists out they should wipe of the face of the earth how, how many times how many times has the president given that direct wipe them off in a situation whereby you the terrorists will be will be will be will be, will be Will be arrested and then or they will be captured during during gun exchange and the terrorists will, will have a change of mind at the point of capture where is that done to see that okay they have repented i return them back to say if the society rewards criminality that's what you get we have a situation whereby it is more it is more it is more lawful to be unlawful and unlawful to be lawful that's the situation we have in our country. I'll take that again. It is more lawful to be unlawful than to be unlawful, lawful to be unlawful. So that's that, that's the irony to start COVID to start. You started on an ironic note. So I, I, I will play on that irony. So it's that's the situation. You see people that are meant to maintain the law, breaking the law at me. Our governors are law breaker. One, they break traffic. They break traffic rules. They don't break traffic rules. They don't have respect for people utilizing the road. They send you away with signing on the road. Our security agencies, particularly the police, they drive against one way at will. Once there is a little traffic, they drive against 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 traffic. When the law, when the people that should maintain the law are the law breaker, they will maintain law and order in society. You are calling for order. When there's no maintenance of law, when there's no respect for the law by institutions that should respect the law. We have a country that you say some I don't know I've asked it several times. How do you measure repentance of, of a criminal mind? <laughs> so so but if you are giving a terrorist the opportunity to repent, someone like Baba Jesha too. Could have got could have gotten to the court and tell me lord sir <laughs> i'm sorry i'm repenting <laughs> so I, can, I can't help but love me lord, <laughs> will, have, me lord will have granted will have granted baba yes i reprieve i say okay let him go for rehabilitation <laughs> once he's rehabilitated he does not need a jail term so he's a repentant people sexual stealing. offender people, <laughs> uh, people committing small 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 petty crimes are sent to jail and you have someone, people committing heinous crime, crime against humanity, crime against the state, and you are giving them the opportunity to repent. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Julia Johnson, uh, still to stay with security, um, uh, update on the Kuje uh, inmates who fled uh, from captivity. We hear that uh, so far, uh, front page of the Punch newspaper, so far, uh, 421 of them have been recaptured whilst uh, 454 of them are still at large and uh, of course um, Ralph Aribe Shalawagbeni himself the Minister of Interior went there a couple of days ago and said that um, none of them nobody who breaches the walls of the prison should be made to see the next day you know you know should be alive um, and all the statements going around I don't know if these statements still hold water you know, when the president says wipe terrorists off the face of the earth, I don't know if it holds weight again because it's been said several times we'll end, we'll end insecurity, we'll ban it. Just say so it's too much and we don't see anything going on. But interestingly, uh, some countries in the West African sub region are placing their security operatives on red alert uh, because of this, this uh, situation of 554 of the inmates of Kuje uh, Medium Correctional Center. Uh, being at large, for instance, in Ghana, uh, the Ghanaian, uh, you know, immigration, uh, sorry, Ghanaian police forces uh, have told the immigration officials and those border patrol officials to intensify uh, their search, you know, their vigilance and all that. So it's quite quite a situation for Nigeria's image, and countries within the sub region are also afraid. Um, then what about those of us who are within the country? So what are your thoughts on this update? Five forty-five. Uh, or 554 rather, right, still at large? Five, the 421 that have been arrested, as it been, who are, who are those that validated the number? What are the identity? I think 
if this had happened in other client, there would be a press conference, a press conference whereby these people might be paraded. And there, is, there will be an openness and transparency. We are just dealing with figures. We are a society that people love to ban the figures. Four than 21. Through what means? Were they, were they, were they rearrested? Um, the five or four, 54 at large. What are their identity? Now, in, in civilized crime, or in a trans, don't let me use civilized, in a transparent crime, now, there will be daily updates with respect to what has happened. You see that? That issue, we have moved away from it. It is just the media that is doing spotlight, a little bit of spotlight on it, and we have continued government as, as usual. Not a single person has been fired. Not a single person has been held responsible. And you begin to wonder, are we running a nation or what are we running? Now, let's put it in perspective. If it's if it's your private organization, or if it is your family, let's say Nigeria is a family, and something of this nature happens in the family, what do you think will happen to every member of the family with respect to those that they have called the heads, the various heads and sub heads of the family? Because the government is not transparent enough with respect to this issue. And those that are responsible have not been held culpable. You see, look, you recall the jailbreak in a do state. We have had one, two, three, four, five jailbreaks, and nothing happens. But 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 the minister of interior was um, he was at uh, Kirikiri Medium and Maximum uh, Correctional Facility um, two days ago. Uh, where he said that uh, he proudly, you know, uh, uh, proclaimed, he actually said that uh, the, 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 the prisons and, um, uh, had successfully, you know, curtailed jail breaks from within. That there had been several attempts to break the jail from within. And they had successfully made sure that no single jail break from within had, you know, been carried out. You know uh, that the only thing that has happened was that they they the attempt from people from outside the prisons to break their friends inside was uh, was a problem but that there was nothing that happened from within maybe some opportunity for us to commend the uh, minister of interior for a job well done oh, I, I, I agree i agree with him to that i agree with him on that i agree with him on that that what you have seen in Estela, and it has to do with Estela security outside of the jail, what we, which have to do with the internal security of our nation as as, as a country. Uh, how, safe, how safe are we going Look, If you have people that have been jailed, breaking jail, and going around the street unarrested, there's, there's, there's double danger, double danger. In fact, government is... It's better for government to secure them in jail than for them to be one. They were, they were dangerous to the society, dangerous to the community, dangerous to the people. Now, you put them in prison, they have become more ardent if they succeed in breaking, breaking out from the jail. And now, we have, we have serious problems on our hands, and neighboring countries are tightening the loose in order to prevent these people from entering into, into their country. See, all those that have been arrested, that whose arrest have been people, what was the factor in the time? They were caught with they were caught with drugs. They were caught with drugs. It was just routine checks by men of men and women of the Nigerian Enforcement Agency that one that was arrested in Abuja. Others that were one or two that were, that were arrested. Was reported in the media. Were, were, were people, they were caught with drugs. They were caught with cannabis. They were caught with different types of drugs. Jide, um, let's also look at the, the Guardian newspaper. And this is very interesting because it comes from the WHO. And we understand you know, how it is uh, with the WHO, the uh, IMF, and uh, you know, the World Bank. Well, Africa records 63% jump in diseases spread from animals to humans. 
That's what the World Health Organization is quoted to say. Uh, what, are you th what are your thoughts at the moment? Do you think that we're having all of this because of the consumption or what's really going on? You know, when it comes to Africa, it's easier for WHO, IMF, and the rest of them to name shame or identify diseases, issues that are related with poverty. And with Africa, it's easy. The WHO has not been able to come up with the source and origin of COVID-19. Till date, they've not been able to come up with it. But it's easier to say, okay, so this, okay, see the outbreak of monkeypox that broke in, in, in Western world some, some few weeks back. If, if it had happened in Africa, I'm sure they would have shot our border and prevented us from from, from traveling, from traveling abroad. <coughs> I have no issues with their reports with respect to, um, <coughs> excuse me, with respect to to providing us with with, with figures of, of this outbreak this has been spreading out. Because when we are there, we are not at ourselves. Our leaders, when they are sick, they go abroad to seek medical help. So our medical facilities cannot. It's not that these issues are not in Western world, but they have a developed and fully developed healthcare system that is that is that addresses whatever disease in society by through at it. But we don't have we don't have any uh, look. All of these things you are talking about in this in the in the seventies in the eighties. Do we have all of these problems? When our medical facilities, even our primary health care system, some of the issues that our secondary and tertiary health care system could not take account because there are no equipment. Doctors are, 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 are training themselves. The society is not investing money in training in training in training doctors and medical medical, medical professionals. So it's it's for me the angle which I look at is the failure of leadership on our part. To provide what is required to, pre to, 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 to protect to protect our people from out of disease um, that might arise from what we have identified. So if you have to, if you have enough healthcare facility, this won't be an this, this won't be an issue. All right, um, uh, let's let's look at the uh, the one coming off the front page of the Punch newspaper, uh, which talks about. Um, uh, jet A1 scarcity, uh, um, you know, hitting the headlines. It's talking about avi aviation fuel. Uh, and, of course, it says that uh, the passengers are protesting delayed flights. It's becoming a tale of a repeated tale of, um, uh, of failure in the aviation sector. I mean, it's somehow okay. mirroring, mirroring, you know, failure in different parts of national life. Um, it seems to be no end in sight. You know, Jenny Johnson, do you see an end in sight? I mean... Oh, are we? Are we? Okay. Uh, do we have? Uh, is it a lost cause till twenty twenty three? Kofi, I went to Ray last week. I heard, and I, as I was embarking the, project, I saw a big generator being used to power to power the aircraft while the aircraft was still was 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 still on the tarmac, and journalists in me. Let me to ask the guy question. What is this big thing doing? Oh, he said it's a generator. He said they are using generator to power. Oh, I quickly put one on, one plus one together. I said, okay, you are powering it with generator, with digital generator, so that people can embark on the aircraft in order for you to save fuel. And the guy smiled. And all you need to do is, to, is, is, is when we were, while I was coming back from Oweri, the same thing happened. The generator does not have enough power. The AC is in the aircraft. Big aircraft was, was off until we were about taking off. That's when they put it on. That's, that tells you how horrible and how terrible this is. And you begin to ask yourself a question. You have someone calling himself or herself Minister of Petroleum. You have a Minister of State. You have an NPC. You have National Assembly. You have various agencies 
ministries and departments of government, people that have been given responsibility, and not a single fella deem it fit to regularly inform us of what is wrong. Look, for the first time, I poured fuel. When I returned from when I returned from Oweri on Friday, I had to go for a meeting in DR in Ikeja. Then I drove my car thinking I'll get fuel. I poured four liters. I was pain as I was coming back home from Ikeja that the fuel inside my car should not be exhausted. It was a traumatic experience. Nigerians are going through trauma. Look, if they do mental health check for Nigerians, I can assure you. A lot of a lot of ones are suffering from mental health as a result of the trauma government has put up through over the years. Hmm. All right. Uh, 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 so, so I mean, uh, I ask you again, Jimmy Johnson. Is there any end in sight to to this um, this situation of a sort of like a collapse of the aviation sector in the country or near? The president collapse? said he's tired. The president said he's, he cannot wait for him to hand over. He said he's tired hmm. to hand over to his successor. I, I will still have some time in his tenor. Hmm. Was, was someone, but, someone okay. made a joke, a joke sometime and said, uh, was it you, Mercy, that, um, you know, uh, the person hopes to uh, uh, fear or not finish in any airplane while, while in midair. We certainly pray it doesn't happen. You know, our propensity, <laughs> uh, tendency rather to call corners in this part of the world. We certainly pray that that does not happen. Um, because when your fuel finishes on the road, you can just simply park your car and pick up a jerry can. But in the air, where would you, you know. park the car? <laughs> you can't park the car in the in the air. That's true. So I mean, it's a lot. So of, it, it's a lot in the news uh, this morning, and that's because if you look at the papers, it's almost everything uh, that should make us agitated. For instance. 23 million young Nigerians on feed for the job market. That's what the ITF is quoted to say. Uh, that's on uh, the Daily Trust newspaper. And you want to begin to ask the question, why is this? Why do we have, at a time where we should be competing with the you know, global market or our contemporaries outside, you have a population of over 211 million and 23 of them not um, fit for the job market. I mean, this is locally. Well, um, how would you compete globally when majority of the time your, your students are at home through one strike or the other? You know how many years you have lost in training? You see, it's people that are equally trained and equipped that will compete. What competition do you want to do? It's like a football team. One team is training, they've started their preseason eight months, and your own, your own team has been on strike for, for, for five months. And you're asking them to come and play a football match. They should resume play a football match. You want to compare the fitness of those that have been training for eight months that do not have any interruption in their training with those that have a checkered training system. It's not possible. They will collapse. So our, 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 our graduates are not fit and proper. What, but but is it just a marketplace? All right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm listening. Okay, so I, listening. I was going to ask if it's just about the fact that uh, you know the, the students or the people are always at home uh, as to strike, or it's about something about our curriculum because people are moving away from the conventional. And if you look at the world, it's, it's driven by different things, technology and what have you. But if you look at the curriculum, our educational yes. curriculum, if you look at, you know, the structure of our educational system, it's very conventional. People, well, you know, others are moving away from this pattern of education and we're still bent on this. So is it the fact that we're at home or is the problem of, um, you know, the structure of our educational system, including our curriculum? It's part of what that's we strike, you know, it's about providing the facilities. There's nothing wrong with our curriculum. We just want one or two tweak in our curriculum. I can assure you that. I was discussing with a friend who is a bit more knowledgeable than I in this respect, who told me that it will take sixty thousand pounds for you to train a medical doctor in Britain. And you it takes you four thousand, three thousand to four thousand pounds to train that medical doctor in Nigeria. 
and that medical doctor just need to pass one exam in Britain. So it is cheaper to train a medical doctor in Nigeria than to train a medical doctor in, in Great Britain. And you could see from record that our um, doctors that are trained in Nigeria, that practice in Nigeria, travel outside of Nigeria and they are doing well. Same with other people in other clients. I knew how many references I've signed for my students that have gone to schools abroad. They are accountable. Are you with me? It's, it's just that the resources are not there. We have the human resource. The curriculum is there. But the technology, the facilitating technologies are not there. There are no internet facilities in our classrooms. There are no internet facilities in, 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 in our lecture rooms. We don't have smart boards. So these are some of the things that ASU is, is providing for beyond emolument. So it's for government to provide these facilities. And I can tell you, pick an average Nigerian graduate. He or she can compete with anyone, anywhere in the world. Just give him at least 30% of what obtains. 30% give what 30 of what obtains in the United States, Great Britain, to schools in Nigeria. And I will tell you, the Nigerian we excel. We don't even with the zero percent that we have. Our students are still excelling. All right. Uh, you, you, you know just, some of your friends, Kofi, you know some of your friends that have traveled abroad to do their master's program. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Uh, Jiri Johnson, interesting analysis, very passionate one from you. We'd like to thank you very much uh, for your time. And we look forward to having you here shortly next week. It's a pleasure to be with you, Kofi. And Enjoy yourself. It's Friday. Yes. Okay. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Dilly Johnson is the chief lecturer with the Nigerian Institute of Journalism, and that's the size of uh, that segment. Uh, we'll, we'll be back to talk about football. Mercy, um, your, your mates are in, are in um, uh, on the field, you know, scoring goals. I don't know what you're doing here. Wafcon 2022 has been on, and Super Falcons uh, World Defeat came around to make it the semi finals. They call it a $1 million match. We'll talk about that when we come back. But it's the 15th of July. Let's check out what happened today in history, and we'll be back afterwards. <laughs>